The intention of this talk was to give people the opportunity to see kind of a brief overview of all of the tools and how they fit together. One thing that we've wanted to do at PyData events for a while, well, there's a lot of things that we want to do at PyData events for some time. One of them is every time a new version of some project comes out, we'd like to have any people in attendance who might be working on that project to give a short talk. You know, who needs to hear 60 minutes of talk about new color maps in matplotlib, but maybe a 10 minute talk with a series of those in a row outlining all the new features and all the data science projects. I think that's something that we've done in the past that we want to keep doing more of. One thing that I think we'd like to do is for a lot of people at these events, not all of them are people who are in the mud who are using these tools every single day. Some of the people at our events are scientists who really only adopt a tool when they realize that it's useful for their direct work and maybe only when they run into some other tool that needs this, this package or if they're making use of somebody else's or if they're, if they're refer, referring to somebody else's research that happens to use a tool or if they have some, undergraduate, some undergraduates or graduate research assistants who have decided to make use of some tool. It's not the same strongly guided process that a software engineer would go through to decide what tools they use. For a lot of scientists, it really is they focus on the work that they want to do and then they kind of pick which pieces. And so as a result, there's oftentimes not a lot of knowledge about how all the different tools fit together or what even all the tools are. You'll see there are a lot of people who you know, are using NumPy who probably should be using Dined or Pandas or even um, uh, there's actually one project that's uh, not pie tables, it's the other one. It begins with an X, X-Array, 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 X-Array slash X-Array. You know, there's a lot of people who may not be familiar with all the tools that are out there. There are people who should be using pie tables who maybe aren't using pie tables. And so the thought was maybe at some of our events to allocate a little bit of time in order to just go over that. Also, one thing we want to do is pie data events are predominantly, or the attendees of pie data events are predominantly working professional data scientists, researchers, and scientists in academia. And one thing is, it's very difficult for some of you to bring your managers to these events, to bring people in leadership positions, to say, hey, would you like to spend a weekend with me learning about the nitty gritty details of this technology? And yet those people make very important decisions that affect how you use these tools in your organization. And so one thing that we'd like to do is find better ways to reach out to that audience, but without sacrificing the density of technical content that PyData is known for. So just very recently, I was talking to Leah about possible keynote speakers for an upcoming event. And it was actually in reference to one area that's of a lot of interest this year, which is a polling websites. So all these different websites that aggregate polls and do meta-analysis of polls. And there's a lot of those out there one of them's owned by ESPN, one of them's run by uh, the University of Princeton. And I, I said, you know, there's, it would be great to have either the people who run either of those websites come speak at a PyData event. But if you think about it, the feeling for PyData is more of, let's get the person who's at the academic institution who has you know, a very strong quantitative background, a very rigorous background, who's focusing on this in terms of the nitty gritty details and we'll talk about some of the science behind it over maybe just somebody who is gonna give a very fluffy talk about you know, this candidate is great or this, can this candidate's huge or this candidate's maybe not so great. This candidate, or what is it, sad, this candidate's sad or other terms that are used to refer to the two candidates. So that's one thing that we'd like to do. We'd like to engage people in these positions but engage them with a lot of substance and to not just gloss over the details but to give them a very substantial and very uh, credible understanding of how the what the tools are and how they fit together. And so this is the first attempt of it. Now given that this is the first attempt and we have a fairly small audience here, I will probably depart a little bit from the materials that I put together. The materials I put together are just kind of just a very brief overview of all the tools that you see on the banner back here. And instead I'd like to inject a little bit more tutorial content into this to talk about what the projects are, how the projects work, how something becomes a numfocus project, what it means for something to be a numfocus project, what it means to contribute to numfocus and pi data, and show you some ways that you can become a part of that process. Because one thing that's very important, and one thing that 
really became very clear in an email I had to send recently. We were reaching out for keynote speakers for upcoming events, and I had to explain to people who had never heard about PyData or even really attended a Python conference or even maybe even a technical conference what this is all about. And I thought, well, from their perspective, what are they thinking of? They're thinking of PyData in reference to other large vendor conferences run in industry. And I thought, well, one very important part of this is I need to stress that this is a member-driven community. This is a community that's driven by volunteer effort. It's not a big vendor conference. We're not just doing pitches or demos of products. We're talking about open source code. We're talking about code that everybody in this audience could contribute to or could use if they chose. Where it's, it's a very different feel. And so that's one of the directions that we need to take this talk and that we need to take and focus and PyDate in general to figure out how to make it as participatory as possible and to really let you know that I might be here in front of the lectern. It's not a podium because it doesn't, can't stand on it. But in front of the lectern. But that doesn't mean that there's a much of a distance between the two of us. That's why, in fact, I like rooms like this and I like audiences and crowds like this because my goal here is to just talk about open source, why we do it, why we volunteer, where that volunteer effort goes, and really motivate as many of you as much as possible to get involved. So I'll show you some of the materials. As with all of my talks, just because we're being videoed, I do like to start off and just say this is an overview of the NumFocus stack. I'm James Powell. This is Pi Data San Francisco. It's Friday, August 12, 2016. So I'll start off very simply. Who here knows what NumFocus is? Who here has no clue what NumFocus is? Honestly, like some, so the rest of you are somewhere in the middle, in some state of both knowing and not knowing. That probably counts as not knowing. Now notice, when I asked who doesn't know what NumFocus is, Leah here only half-heartedly raised her hand when, sorry, when I asked if they knew what NumFocus is, and she works there. So even she doesn't really know what NumFocus is all about. That's a joke. That's a joke. So the easy answer to this is go to numfocus.org. But I want to tell you, and I would like Leah if she could help, you know, just speak about NumFocus briefly, but NumFocus is a, first and foremost, it's a nonprofit. It's a 501c3. It's a nonprofit in the United States where we have pending EU status. It's a nonprofit that was founded, I want to say, four or five years ago by, by the 2012, so four years ago, uh, by some of the people behind some of the core NumFocus projects, the people behind what used to be called IPython and is now called Project Jupyter, the people behind NumPy, people behind Matplotlib, and the people behind uh, AstroPy. So the developers of these projects, the leaders of these projects, got together and thought, you know, we need to have something that's greater than the sum of our parts. We need to have a nonprofit organization whose purpose is to promote what we're doing, to advance the cause of open source in data science, in scientific computing, in numeric computing, and to help us do things like build community, and as a very practical manner, to help us in the process of raising money. Very recently, a project joined NumFocus. It's toward the bottom of this banner here. It's called Quant Econ. I'll tell you very briefly later on what Quant Econ is, but suffice to say, one of the motivating forces for Quant Econ to join NumFocus, and I'll also tell you what it means to join NumFocus, is they wanted to raise money. They wanted to go to one of these large grant, um, grant giving institutions and say, you know, we want to raise money in order to fund postdocs and to fund work on this project. And this project is not commercial, so there's no revenue here. We need, we need donations. And that institution said, you know, it's very important that you're part of a 501c3, not just administratively, not just legally, but there's some meaning behind that. And they came back and told us after they successfully raised a very large amount of money that one of the core reasons why their proposal was accepted was that they were not just part of a foundation like NumFocus, but that they were part of NumFocus, and that there was a very strong thread tying together all of the projects. That the people reviewing that grant proposal saw that there was more to NumFocus than just this legal entity. There was a mission behind it, and there was the ability for these different projects to collaborate to improve the general situation of open source in scientific computing and data science. You think that's an accurate assessment, Leah? 
So NumFocus is a 501c3. NumFocus happens to be the organization that runs a PyData conferences. And I'll put a, before I move into the next slide, I'll put a little asterisk next to that. PyData conferences, like the conference that you're at right now, are not strictly run by NumFocus. They're run by on the ground organizers and volunteers. They're run by you. They're run by people who are motivated to be part of and build a community. And those people say, there's a lot of interest in data science. We want to build a community here. We don't want that community to be beholden to any one corporate interest. We want to do that out in the open, transparent. We want it to be, we want everybody be, to be welcome to participate in this. And we want to do it in such a way as it supports the tools themselves. They come to NumFocus and say, we want to run an event. Uh, recently, we've gotten emails about potentially a PyData event in Philadelphia, PyData events in St. Petersburg and Moscow, a PyData event in Colombia. And in, the, in each of these cases, it's not us going to those places and creating an event. It's them coming to us and saying, we want to, we want to be part of something bigger. They engage NumFocus, and NumFocus says, well, there's a lot of me me mechanics. There's a lot of operational logistical details to running a conference. I mean, there's catering, there's t-shirts, there's all that. And NumFocus is willing to take upon a lot of the administrative work. You wouldn't believe how much invoicing there is for just a small conference. Additionally, NumFocus is interested in making sure that all of the events follow in a set of guiding principles. And these guiding principles haven't been enumerated, but I can riff a couple of those for you. One of them is that we want to make sure that every talk is about open source. We want to make sure that there's no vendor talks. There's nobody coming here trying to sell you something. I always like to say one little caveat to that, which is we've done events at Microsoft in the past. We will do an event at Microsoft next year. There will be a speaker today speaking, or sorry, a speaker tomorrow speaking about Windows. And in that one case, you could think, you could see a talk about Windows, but you can't use anything in that talk unless you pay money for Windows. But I feel that there's, a, there's an extenuating circumstance there and that Windows is just such a big thing. But other than that, we don't want speakers to come and say, oh, here's something great that I built. Now pay me money before you can use it. That's not in the spirit of open source. It's not in the spirit of community. These talks are not supposed to pitch you in the sense of convince you to buy something. But they can pitch you in the sense of convincing you to buy into an idea or to buy into an approach. But there shouldn't be, they should be non-commercial in nature. That's one of the guiding principles. Another one is when we look at the schedules of these events and we help, we help put together the schedule and help with the collection of proposals and help with the, with the proposal selection committees, I actually sit on those proposal selection committees and they're typically run by the on the ground organizers in the sense that they're the ones who are saying, I like this talk, I don't like this talk. I think this talk would be better if it's a tutorial. I think this talk would be better if they covered more of this material. I've seen this speaker before, it was great, things like that. Those are the decisions they make. The reason I sit on those is to make sure that, for example, when they go through all the talks, we do another pass and we say, well, listen, are we representing all the different areas equally? Are we broadly representing all of our community equally? It's a very important thing to numb focus. Are we making sure that we don't have the same speakers giving talks over and over and over again, and we're making it difficult for new speakers to come up and to give their very first talk? And so those are some of the core principles that we focus on. So NumFocus has that responsibility in providing some overall governance to PyData. It's also the role that NumFocus has with regard to the projects themselves. So let me tell you, let's talk about what the NumFocus projects are, because that's what the topic of this tutorial session was supposed to be. There are two links on the NumFocus website with the projects. I'm going to open them both up, and we'll just briefly take a look. And you can see that, you can see all of them represented on the banner behind me. And under this affiliated project list, you can see some which are not on the banner behind me. And you can see some which you might recognize, scikit-learn, of course, and some which you might spider even, some which you might not recognize, the aforementioned X array. Uh, orange, actually, I don't know. I still don't know what orange is. Um, some which you might not might have seen in a long time. PyLab, Python XY is here. Um, And you can see that this hasn't quite been updated because we have a couple of projects to be added to this. Um, if she's able to, I'd like to invite Leah to speak about some of the new projects that are in the process of applying for sponsorship from NumFocus. So Phoenix is one that's already gotten through the process. There's a couple other that are in the pipeline. But that's up to Leah if she wants to discuss that. What you can see is there's a difference between sponsors and affiliated projects. 
And this is one reason why I really wanted Leah to be part of this, this tutorial session so that we could speak very specifically about that. Think about this. All of you have some code that you've written that you'd like to put out into the world, that you'd like to put on GitHub, and you'd like to make into something more than just yet another repository that people start that you refer to on your resume when you're applying for your next job. Maybe you have something that you've been working on for a very long time, and you really want to see it thrive. And maybe you even have already gotten a lot of interest from people submitting bug, bug reports, submitting patches, helping you with this project, but you want to turn it into something more than just a, a bunch of people on GitHub approving pull requests. You might even want to raise money for that. You might say, well, listen, we all are very busy in our day jobs, and one of us is you know, one job change away from not being able to manage this project anymore. So we need to make sure this project is sustainable. We need to make sure that this tool, which we put all this effort into, is still maintained five or 10 years from now. How often have you gotten really excited about something that you saw on GitHub? You're like, this is gonna solve all of my problems. Then you look on the right column when the last commit was, and you're like, this hasn't been updated for three years. There's no way this is gonna work. This is a, a very serious problem for a lot of projects. And I can tell you in my own experience, I've seen a lot of projects where I was really excited from the description of what it does, and then I try and use it. Oh, it's not compatible with the version of Python that I'm using. Oh, there's no Python 3 version for it. Oh, you know, the, some API behind the scenes has changed. And I don't really want to dig into that project to work out all those details. And the project maintainer has moved on to other things. And I can't complain that they've moved on to other things. It's a volunteer effort. But you can see that these projects are not sustainable. It would be very, it would have a very big impact on all of our lives if that happened to any of these projects. And that's one of the goals of them Focus, to make sure that all of these projects are sustainable. That if you go to somebody in your company and say, we're gonna build something, and we're gonna build something big that's gonna last for 10 years. And we're gonna build it on NumPy, we're gonna build it on Python, NumPy, using the notebook, they have some assurance that that code will still run in 10 years' time, that it'll still be supported. Think about if you're a researcher and you're producing research today, and that research could go make policy decisions, it could affect policy decisions. People are, need, are gonna need to revisit that research in five or 10 years' time when they start to see the effects of that policy. That code needs to be reproducible, it needs to still run. In order for that code to still run, there need to be people who are actively maintaining that code base, who understand who, who understand what has changed in that code base from when you first run your analysis to now, who are able to give you guidance in terms of how to rerun old code. And you would be, I, I once tried an exercise. I spent an entire weekend on this. I thought, what happens if it's the end of the world? And I'm left with just a computer and I need to rerun all the code. I need to rebuild civilization but, but, not, but not in the biblical sense, in the sense of rebuilding all the code that has been lost because of some apocalyptic situation. So I thought, okay, I can build the tools that I use in the data science stack from source. I can download the source code for Jupyter and I can build the pieces that are not pure Python. I can do the same thing for most of maybe NumPy and SciPy. Some of the Fortran stuff is a little bit hard to build, but I can build a lot of that from source. And I can build Python from source. So I don't really need, if Anaconda falls off the face of the earth, it would really negatively affect my life, but I could struggle and make things work. So the next question is, well, that's great, but can I build my compiler? So I started to try to build my compiler. I thought, can I bootstrap this? Could I, sitting at a, at a desk with a computer that had nothing on it, build a really small compiler that could build a bigger compiler, that could build a bigger compiler, that could build GCC, that could build Python, that could build the data science stack? And you could think that it's not, it, it, it might not be, it is a far-fetched scenario, so it may not be the most realistic scenario, but it is worthwhile to think about if you're really concerned about reproducible research. So I tried this. I can't build GCC more than three years back on, on my machine at all. I can't build a, a, an older GCC with a newer GCC. I can't start with the oldest GCC and build a GCC. I can't start with a non-GCC compiler and build a GCC. It's pretty much nothing I could do other than maybe get old ISOs, run them in a virtual machine, and build things. It's actually quite surprising how brittle some of the foundational software that we rely upon is. And think about, I couldn't even start to build those tools because of fundamental changes in the compilers themselves much less build GCC, 
and all of the libraries that they depend on, the hundreds of libraries they depend on. I mean, think about it. If you, if you suddenly had to bootstrap a working Linux install, it wouldn't be possible without the continuity of, of um, sustainability, like without the continuity of development that we take for granted. So that said, the core question was the difference between a sponsored and affiliated project. So you've already bought into the value of sustainability. You've already bought into the value of having somebody who can help you with issues of governance, help you decide the direction of that project. Sponsored and affiliated projects are one of the core distinctions between the projects behind NumFocus. Affiliated projects are projects for whom NumFocus has helped by raising money or by giving grants. Sponsored projects are really the core of what we talk about when we talk about the NumFocus projects. Uh, there's actually two separate types of sponsored projects. There's the grantor grantee and the comprehensive sponsored projects. Leah can actually tell you which of these projects are under which model. But essentially in the comprehensive model, oops, in the comprehensive model, the intellectual property for that project is signed over to NumFocus and NumFocus manages that project. NumFocus is the organization who owns the intellectual property of that project and manages it. Very much in the same way that the PSF owns the intellectual property for the Python language and handles high level issues around that. The reason for that can be as, as small as I have a project and I have some of my coworkers who work at some company who work on this project and I want this to be an open source project. We hear the word open source bandied about all the time and it means many different things. Typically, it means nothing more than the source code exists somewhere. Not even under version control, not even the most recent source code, not even the history of all the source code, but some copy of the running source code exists somewhere. And that's all that it means for open source. And so you can see a lot of people who talk about their open source research. Well, it's open source in the sense that there's some directory with some version of the code that may or may not work, that may not be the version that they actually used in the paper that's available. And you can think that there are gradations of, of that meaning of open source. You can think that a lot of companies like to talk about their commitment to open source. And what that means is they have a GitHub page under their company name and they release some version of the code on GitHub and that's about it. And if you say, well, there's a bug here, here's a pull request, maybe they respond, maybe they don't. If you say, I don't like the direction that this project is going, who can I talk to because I think it needs to go this direction or I want to contribute to that, they probably will not respond. The actual management of the project is done internally at the company. It's just the artifacts of that, the source code itself, are available to the world to see. And you can think that that's, you know, it's better than getting a binary because you can't really do much with the binary, but it's only a slight translation. It's just the artifact that existed before the construction of the binary. But otherwise, the actual benefits of it being open source are missing. In NumFocus's view, open source should mean much more than that. Now, there is a humongous debate between what it means for something to be free versus open source. And that's something I don't think I want to get into. Uh, if, you f if you read Hacker News, there was a debate about that very recently uh, with a lot of contentious comments. But I want to talk a little bit higher level, a little bit more broadly about what open source is. Consider that a software project where all the contributors and all the developers and all the people leading that project work at a single company, it's open source and they should be lauded for that project being open source, but it's not a community project. It's not a project that anybody off the street can contribute to without having to jump through certain hoops. Certainly, any company is more than happy to take bug reports or bug fixes from people if they don't have to pay for it. But does that mean that they're willing to entertain discussions publicly about the direction of the project? Does that mean they're willing to tell people this is where the project is going in six months time or a month time? There's no guarantee of that at all. A community project, and an open source project, is a project where the community is the organization that, that pushes for that project. Where if you want to make changes to that project, there's at least a stated way to make change to that project, a governance document that says this is the steering committee that makes these decisions. Here's transparency in terms of how the decisions are made. This project is not has anyone used an open source project that then became closed source? I used one that I won't name that was closed source, became open source, then became closed source again, then the company ran out of business, then became open source. And you can think that if, if this is part of some corporate IP, then there's severe restrictions about the use of that tool as well. 
or whether that tool will stay open source. A community project is a project where we know that it's open source today, it'll be open source tomorrow, it'll be open source the next day. There's some guarantee that the governance of this project is in the hands of the community, that by virtue of being part of a nonprofit, they're free from certain commercial influences that, and I don't want to ascribe malevolence to it, but there are certain commercial influences where if you have a startup and you produce a lot of open source code and the startup folds, you may be under certain restrictions as to who owns that code or whether that code can still stay in the wild that are outside of your control. And it's unfortunate, but it happens, and it happens actually fairly often, which is often why you'll see startups where you can't figure out their funding model. A lot of the code is open source because the people who work on it are like, if this thing falls over, I at least want to be able to use the code that I wrote for the last five years. That said, in the grantor grantee, so that's, that's open source from a view of a comprehensive model. Now, I'm not actually sure of all of the projects and where they fit under the grantor grantee versus comprehensive split. I know that the actual split for non-focused projects is a little bit more nuanced than just those two categories. But in my understanding, the grantor grantee is more of a legal relationship where the project already has its own internal mechanisms that they manage for the governance of the project, and non-focused serves more of a legal purpose than this community purpose. Would you say that's accurate? The purpose of this talk was to go through the projects and to give you a very brief overview of how they fit together and what they are. So I would say the very beginning of this is we can, we can actually go to the sponsored project and the affiliated project pages. But I think, in my view, there's actually quite a few different graphics that people have for how they look at these. And the graphics are uniformly pretty terrible. I'll show you two of them. Um, two of them pulled from other presentations. but. Here's one. I mean, this isn't, this isn't so bad. The scientific ecosystem where you can see there are kind of bands or orbits of different projects. And here's another one that's just pretty horrible. Because uh, I don't know why Cython sits on top of SciPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib. So I have no idea how these are supposed to be orientated. But I, I would say that you can think probably the most visible product, project that you use is going to be Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook and IPython. So the notebook in which I built those slides, and the notebook that we're all familiar with, the one that we all love, written by, uh, or at least project led by Fernando Perez and Brian Granger, is a non-focused project. It's actually one of the first projects. Uh, when, was it Jupyter who joined non-focus or IPython? It was IPython. So this is actually before the introduction of the Jupyter brand. By the way, Brian Granger will be here tomorrow speaking about his next project, Altair Visualization Library which is still too early in the process to consider you know, something like fiscal sponsorship. But Leah, I've seen, has already started bugging him and asking him, why isn't this an unfocused project? Because the reason is, when you weave a rich tapestry of projects, it makes each of the projects better. And I want to talk to you about, I want to make sure that I speak about that before the end of this, because there's something that NumFocus is doing this year that, has, that they've not done in the last four years that really speaks to the reason to have this coalition of aligned projects. Before I go into the Python side, I'd like to say that PyData has a reputation for being a Python conference. Py is in the name. And a lot of the original projects, AstroPy, Matplotlib, IPython, 
were all Python and NumPy were all Python projects. The NumFocus sometimes has a reputation of being focused just on Python. That's not true. NumFocus was founded to support open source scientific software, irrespective of what language it is. So while you're in your Jupyter Notebook, starting at the very beginning, you might want to use the Julia language. And it turns out that the Julia language is also a NumFocus fiscally sponsored project. So if any of you out there are planning to use Julia language, it's a fantastic tool. It's a nice replacement for R. In fact, if you would like to learn more about the Julia language, there is a fantastic tutorial. Which room are you in? You're going to be in this room right after the session, right after this session, giving a tutorial about Julia. So I won't actually speak about it that much more, but I'll tell you, it's a great replacement for R. In my humble opinion, I would not use it as a replacement for Python just because it's more of an analytical or scientific tool than a systems tool. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't write a, uh, I would use it as the core of my analysis surrounded by some pieces that are for operational use. I don't know if that's an unfair assessment or not. It is, however, a very, very exciting project. And I hope in Tony's demos, he'll show you some of the exciting demos of just the very easy to write generic code that runs faster than you could believe. Additionally, if you think about open source scientific tools, there's Python, which we'll get to, there's Julia, and there is R. NumFocus actually fiscally sponsors a project in the R ecosystem called R OpenSci. Now, R OpenSci is a little bit hard to pin down in terms of what it is if I wanted to describe to you what R OpenSci is. I would say for a Python programmer, R OpenSci is the equivalent of, it sits somewhere halfway between something like, something like PyPI and something like SciPy. It's a collection of, of packages for scientific computing written by the R OpenSci contributors and also written by members of the community that are made available via R OpenSci. One of R OpenSci's focuses is reproducibility in computing. And when you look at, let me see if I can show you the packages. And when you look at this topic of reproducibility in research and reproducible computing, this is another common thread that you see throughout the NumFocus projects. One thing about Jupyter Notebook is, Jupyter Notebook isn't just about having slick web-based environments. It is about being able to bridge the gap between what you publish in your research or what you deliver in your research and the actual code that you run so that it's not the case that we all remember a couple years back economic analysis where they had hidden a couple of rows and the analysis turned out to be incorrect. When we shorten, when we, when we shorten that gap between the two, we can avoid those kind of issues. So our OpenSci is kind of a collection of packages for the R language for a variety of different scientific tasks. Additionally, before I dive into Python, there are a couple of other things that are part of NumFocus that aren't exactly software projects. Two of, I think, the most exciting new NumFocus projects that joined in the last, I want to say, two years, two or three years, are data carpentry and software carpentry. We have a, one of the board members for NumFocus and, one of, and the leader of Data Carpentry coming tomorrow to speak to you, Tracy Teal. She'll be keynoting in the morning. Data Carpentry and Software Carpentry are initiatives, they're educational initiatives where we've all seen scientific code, we've all seen the quality of code written by scientists, but it's not their fault, it's not their priority, and it's not their background. And there's a lot of value that can be brought by helping researchers understand how to use software better, and not just understanding. And there's one thing I, I think is very critical. It's not just understanding how to program better. It's not just learning about async IO and Python 3.5, or learning about you know, multiple dispatch in Julia. It's also about the software development process. A lot of people working in scientific research, or people, or even data scientists, are still too far from what you might consider as good practice in software development. And I'll give you an example, and I, and I hate to harp on the R community, but the R community is a lot of statisticians who don't come from a software development background. So I was seeing a talk, I saw a talk uh, last year at an R conference, and 
the speaker was like, reproducibility, reproducible computing is really important. So what I do is, whenever I put something up on GitHub, I create a readme file with all the packages that it needs. And I was like, that's the level of reproducibility that you've reached? There's no thought of, I mean, think about all the various approaches for packaging in the Python ecosystem and for being able to deterministically reproduce computing environments. And then for some, for some environments, for statisticians, you know, they're at the stage of just saying, oh, remember to install these three. Don't worry about the version number. That's apparently not that important. Or don't worry about the exact code that's running. That's not that important. Or, you know, containerizing it so it's actually reproducible. You know, they're still lagging behind. And I don't want, I'm, and I'm going to say that that's not a criticism of them. It's just that for as statisticians, their focus is not, doesn't, doesn't go far beyond the statistics that they want to do. And so there's a lot of information about good practice and software development that they need to, that, th that they know they need to do better, that they know they need to improve on, but they just don't have the resources for them. And that's the purpose of initiatives like software carpentry and data carpentry, to be able to bring that to researchers, to be able to tell them, you know, there's a reason that version control is something that no programmer, no software developer would live without, and here are the advantages of it, and here's how you can integrate it into your workflow without having to pay all that cost of enormous amounts of, of overhead and setup. It's not just some kind of self-indulgent, gratuitous application of software development process. There's actual real benefits from this, and here's how you can employ those benefits without having to necessarily go down the rabbit hole of incredibly logistically complex deployment workflows. Additionally, there's one more, there's one more num focus project that kind of sits in the middle, Quant Econ. Quant Econ started as an educational project. Uh, Tom Sargent, a 2011 Nobel Prize winner in economics, had a mission to improve the, improve the quality of discourse in economics, especially with regards to computational methods and numerical methods. And so Quant Econ started as a collection of essentially notebooks in Jupyter, and, sorry, in Jupyter notebooks in Python and Julia, just teaching topics in econometrics and in, and, and in economics. Um, since becoming a NumFocus fiscally sponsored project, Quant Econ has decided to actually take a lot of the common code that they've seen in a lot of these projects and look towards building tools, look towards building libraries, look towards simplify, you know, building an equivalent of something like AstroPy, but for economists. At least that's my understanding of. Yeah. So in addition to that, so the rest of these are basically Python projects, and I wanted to show you kind of how they fit together. Oh, Stan is not a Python project, but has Python bindings. So this was, can I tell them the story of Stan? It's all, it's all true. So Stan was, uh, Stan was, it, I mean, it's all out there. So Stan was, I don't know if I really should say this, but Stan, Stan was one of these things where I went to JuliaCon uh, two years ago, and I talked about NumFocus at JuliaCon, and somebody came up to me from a certain project who I won't name, and they were like, you know, when I go to my university and I get a grant, they take 60 cents for every dollar that I get, and that's an absurd amount of money that's not going to the project, that's going to administrative costs. And I said, you know, NumFocus takes less than 15% of that, they were like, no, maybe we should become a NumFocus project. <laughs> that is one of the driving forces for becoming a NumFocus project in that as an organization that is outside of you know, the very large bureaucracies of the university system, they're able to put a lot more of the money that's brought into the project directly to actually supporting the project and kind of trim, I mean, you can see kind of a bare bones operation here, but trim, trim some of the fat, right? Um, Stan is a project coming out of Columbia, coming out of Andy Gelman's research group. Uh, it's a statistical modeling tool. Um, Stan, kind of, Stan has its own DSL for, for uh, defining statistical models, and then they, compiled, they, they wrote a C++ library to take that DSL, parse it, and compile it, and then provide uh, analysis, giving your model. It's a very powerful tool. It, is, it has bindings for R and Python, and so most likely most of you will be using Stan via its bindings, PyStan. I don't think we've had anybody at any PyData events come speak about PyStan, uh, but I think that's something that would be very valuable because it's a, it's a very powerful and very useful tool. 
Um, so I think those are, I think the rest of our tools are all Python tools. So let's start with, let's start with the sticker game. So after lunch, or actually in the afternoon today, we'll have all the stickers out at the NumFocus booth. And the reason that I decided to put together this tutorial was in part, when we have all the stickers laid out at the booth, people want to take stickers. They don't always know what the stickers are. And they ask, what's that the sticker for? And so it puts us on the spot to be able to say, oh, that's a sticker for such and such. And then they, of course, are going to ask, well, what, is, what does that do? So you have to learn what all the projects do, even if you don't use them. There are a couple of these projects that I can't go into a lot of depth in terms of what they do, just because they are far outside of my area of expertise. In fact, I'll tell you which of those they are. I don't really know a lot about GenSim or, there's, or Scikit Bio. They're just too far outside of what I do in terms of my work. I can tell you very briefly what they are, but I can't tell you some of the nitty gritty details. So with the sticker game, I'll tell you the stickers which people have the hardest time recognizing. So the first one that people have a really hard time recognizing is a NumPy sticker. Except once you tell them it's a NumPy sticker, they kind of understand what the logo is supposed to be about, and everybody knows what NumPy is. It's a library in Python for n-dimensional arrays and computations on them. And so now you can kind of understand what it is. It's an n-dimensional array. That's what the sticker is. See, it's a three-dimensional array. And so, of course, that's that. Matplotlib, of course, we're all familiar with Matplotlib. Many, one thing that you might not know, Matplotlib, I feel, is something, is, is a tool very similar to Bash and SQL in the sense that most people who learn Matplotlib learn it from tutorials that were written five or 10 years ago and completely fail to re recognize that these are actively developed. So when was the last time you, you met somebody and they're like, I know SQL, except they learned SQL like around SQL 92 about 14 years ago, and you're like, well, you know, there's actually, a, there's actually a very recent SQL standard. It has a lot of really neat features. Or somebody who's writing Bash as though it were 1996. You're like, well, you know, Bash 4 came out about 10 years ago. There's a lot of neat features. A lot of the stuff that you're doing in Bash, you don't have to do anymore. Same thing with matplotlib. Matplotlib's not ugly anymore. It used to be pretty, pretty rough to look at, but now it's pretty nice to look at. And they've put a lot of effort into improving the just the visual appeal of the graphs. It's actually a very actively maintained project, and it's something where you can get a lot of value out of keeping up to date with changes in matplotlib, even though it's been around for so long. When you look at a lot of reference materials, when you look at a book or look at some tutorials online, you're bound to run into things which are maybe five or 10 years, or, or written five or 10 or 15 years ago. Five or 10 years ago, I'd say. Um, another one that people don't recognize unless it has the name of the project in it. SymPy, the snake in the cube. SymPy is a computer algebra system. It's basically a symbolic mathematics system. Um, we, it's a project that's been around for a very long time. I would say if you want to compare it to something that you might be more familiar with, it's a subset, of, a much smaller subset of some of the functionality that people are originally drawn to when they want to use a tool like Mathematica. So being able to do symbolic algebra, being able to do symbolic differentiation, integration, being able to do math in Python that's not just numerical approaches, that's actual math. Uh, the next project that we'll talk about is AstroPy. And as Leah said, AstroPy was one of the founding projects for NumFocus. It was one of the first projects that joined. It's essentially a tool for astronomers for astronomy calculations. You can do things like um, uh, you, can, you can predict where the stars are going to be and star maps and things like that. Uh, it is one of these tools that's a little bit outside of my area of expertise just because I don't do any astronomy work. But you can understand from the name that even if the logo isn't as clear, we should probably at some point figure out what the logo is supposed to represent. There's one other example of a tool whose logo we we don't quite know what it is, although I had some thoughts. YT. Everybody wants to know what YT is because the name isn't that descriptive. So YT is a tool for volumetric data, um, geospatial data. And so when, when I heard geospatial data and I looked, at, I looked at the image, I thought, is that a topological graph? But apparently this is something, it's used in um, uh, astronomy as well. And so apparently this is some astronomical figure. So it's a case of having a sticker logo that's not quite as obvious as you might think. 
uh, Pi Tables. Pi Tables is a project that's been around for a very long time that does a lot of really fancy things, but just doesn't seem to get that much marketing. A lot of, a lot of the time you have enormous amounts of data that you don't want to, that you don't have the ability to load into memory all at once that you want to do analysis on. Most likely you're going to reach for a tool like HDF5 for, in order to store this data. Pi Tables is a very convenient wrapper over on-disk data for giving you something akin to pandas like manipulation of that data. I've used it. It's a very simple tool, but, I, but it's a very helpful tool. I used it when I had financial data, which was you know, tick level data that was far too large for me to load into memory in a single Python process at one point in time. But I had so much and I only need to look at a small subset of it and need to filter through it and pull out certain, certain parts of that signal. Uh, Pi Tables is closely, is developed by some people who are closely associated with another project that's not an unfocused project. It's much lower level than all of these, but Blosk, I would really suggest if you're interested in incredibly large data sets and how to manipulate them, Blosk is a very interesting project. It's a compression library. Uh, at PyData Berlin 2013, there was a talk about Blosk by uh, Francesc Alted, where he had some really nice demos where he showed that in some cases, memory bandwidth was so small, but processing power was so great, he could compress data. He could, he could, he could compress data that he would be, that he could compress data coming, that he was loading into memory. Or let me see if I remember the exact details. Um, he was doing operations on compressed data, or on, he was, sorry, he was loading data in compressed form into memory, performing operations on it, and then compressing it back, and it was faster than running on the, the uncompressed data itself. I, I, I don't think that I've uh, relayed his results too precisely, but I would suggest that you look at that. And so that's an overview of all of the projects here. Of course, IPython is a NumFocus supported project separate from Jupyter. As you know, there's been a forking between these two where Jupyter refers to tools like the notebook that are used in Julia, Python, and R. IPython exists as not only a kernel, but it's still, it's still an actively maintained Python interactive console replacement. And so for those of you who need to drop down into a Python interactive console, IPython is still actively maintained. And it has a really, really nice multi-line editing mode. So you know, everybody always has some pain with IPython using multi-line editing because you can't scroll up or you can't change things. Uh, the recent IPython has really nice mode for doing that. So those are all of the fiscally sponsored projects. I want to show you some of the affiliated projects, and then I want to open the floor for some discussion. And I also want to bring Leah in just to talk about the future of NumFocus and where, where all of you as an audience fit into this. You're going to see a talk, uh, I think it's today, on Bokeh, which is a plotting library for interactive visualization. Bokeh is an affiliated project. Can I tell them about Bokeh? Bokeh is in the process of applying to be a NumFocus project. If this is a tool that you use, please, please, please come speak to Leah, myself, or Brian Vandeven, because they're looking for people to sit on the steering committee for that project. Um, many of you, when you do visualization, you might reach for a tool like Matplotlib. And Matplotlib is a fantastic tool for what you might consider to be publication quality graphics. So if you're producing visualizations that are going to be published, that are part of some paper. Mat Matplotlib gives you an, a, a very fine-grained ability to control the, the specific details of how that is represented in, in published form on paper. Uh, Matplotlib is a little bit weaker in the area of interactive graphics. Bokeh is aiming very directly at interactive visualizations. So the, the demos that you'll see in the Bokeh tutorial are all about, here's how we have a graphic and here's how we can interact with it, beyond things like just you know, highlighting points and zooming in, but also having very richly interactive graphics. You've all seen some of the demos with IPython widgets uh, in, in the Jupyter Notebook. And one thing that people like about that is, suddenly I have some visualization. I can kind of pull a slider back and forth and see how that value affects my computation, but it's slow because it has to redraw every time and it's kind of clunky. I would say the quality of interactive visualizations that you can put together with Bokeh are absolutely incredibly impressive. 
The other thing that Bokeh is focusing on is finding ways to represent incredibly large, incredibly dense, potentially streaming data sets. So there's one demo that uh, Brian Vanovan can show you where he has, I think, millions, I think he has 10 or 20 million data points from the city of New York from some kind of census data that he's representing. And he can zoom in, and he can represent it all at once. And he can zoom in and look at subsets of that, do different filterings of that data set. Very impressive. Now, one reason I, I want to spend a little bit of extra time talking about Bokeh is Bokeh was originally a project that came out of a company called Continuum Analytics. Continuum Analytics is the founding sponsor for PyData and the founding sponsor for, and one of the founding sponsors for NumFocus. It is a for profit company that puts a lot of money and a lot of time into developing open source tools. Anaconda is a product from Continuum Analytics that is also open source. One thing about Bokeh, and, and we've gotten a lot of really positive feedback, and a lot of support from the, the business leaders at Continuum Analytics, is that Bokeh, the main developers for Bokeh are Continuum employees. One thing that is a restriction for a non-focus sponsored project is the people on the steering committee have to represent a variety of different interests. And that's kind of the transition. Continuum has projects that, for one reason or another, it doesn't want to go through the, the well, there's a lot of red tape and a lot of paperwork that needs to be done to make it a non-focused project. Or maybe it's a very small project or it's a project that's very narrowly focused, but it's still open source nevertheless. Bokeh is reaching a point where their des desire to take it from being a, a corporate sponsored nonprofit into a community sponsored, sorry, a, a corporate sponsored open source project into a community sp sponsored uh, open source project. Another similar project is Dask. I don't think we have a Dask talk at this event, but prior, previous PyData events have featured a lot of talks on Dask. Dask is a kind of parallel computing framework. You can think just building computation graphs and um, abstracting where the computations are actually performed. Uh, Cython, I'm sure we're all familiar with Cython. Cython is a transpiler from Python to C. I, I said in my tutorial earlier today that very few people in the audience had ever used async IO for anything. And one of the reasons for that is the push for async IO is usually a performance, a desire for a greater performance, a desire to eliminate um, issues with blocking IO. For data scientists, a lot of the limitation that you have is C you have CPU bound problems, not IO bound problems. And most likely, the optimization strategy that you'll take will be take my code, use Numba to see if I can JIT it. If that doesn't work, try and see if I can Cythonize it. If that doesn't work, try and write it as a C extension module, or if it's for something like a very large data flow problem, use something like Dask. And async IO just doesn't come up that much. Well, Cython is probably the very first step for a lot of you in taking code that's written in Python and seeing if you can either integrate it into code that's written in C or make use of some of the performance benefits of writing C code without actually having to suffer from some of the limitations of the C language. Uh, DIND is a very interesting project that doesn't get a lot of press. Uh, when it first came out, a lot of people were talking about it, but it's a very specific and very narrow tool. DIND is a C++ library for an n-dimensional array. Not, or for, for an n-dimensional typed data. It's a much more general tool than how people usually see it. People often see DIND as or dined as a next generation NumPy or replacement for NumPy. But I would encourage you to look at the tool a little bit closer. It's actually a, a lot more general than just being a NumPy replacement. Um, Numba, the aforementioned Numba is a jitting framework uh, for Python. So using LLVM and using some uh, tools in Python, uh, namely uh, or rather, rather by performing certain static analysis of Python code and using some of the tools in LLVM, taking Python code, producing uh, versions of that Python code that can identify hot paths and then JIT those hot paths. So the original canonical example for Numba was a function that calculated a Mandelbrot fractal. You could think that's a very, it's a problem that has 
very easily identifiable hot paths with very little dynamic nature in terms of the data types that are there. Numbers are able to identify those and get, I think, a thousand times speed up is what they were showing in that original demo. You can think that the approaches here are very similar to what people are trying to do with Py PyPy, except Numba is a tool for CPython code. Orange is one of the tools, including Jemson, that I don't really know that much about. Uh, Python XY, I think a lot of you know Python XY as PyLab, kind of a, com a, a combination of a variety of different tools that are used in um, scientific computing. SciPy, of course, is one of the, actually I'd say SciPy is what, the, the people behind SciPy were also some of the founding members of NumFocus. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's one of them. But SciPy, as many of you already know, is a collection of tools in Python for scientific computing. Whereas NumPy is really just the ND array and things around the ND array, SciPy is more of a grab bag of different things for different areas in scientific computing. So in SciPy, you'll see things like um, spatial subdivision algorithms right next to statistical algorithms like you know, calculating kurtosis. Uh, Scikit-learn and the other Scikit-related projects, Scikit-image and Scikit-bio, I would say that I can't imagine that this talk would give those projects any more press than they already have. Of course, these are your premier machine learning libraries. There has been a very strong push to make Scikit-learn a NumFocus project, and it's something that we hope in the near future can happen. The reason for that is, as you're beginning to see the tapestry of all these projects, imagine you're using your Jupyter Notebook to do machine learning. You do that machine learning with Scikit-learn. Scikit-learn itself uses NumPy behind the scenes. You do some data analysis with Pandas, which is one of the tools I forgot to mention on the fiscally sponsored page. You have some visualization output, you use matplotlib. You have all these tools working in concert with each other, and that's great. But you know, why do we need NumFocus? Well, one of the things that we're trying to do this year is hold a NumFocus summit, a summit of summits. This is going to be held uh, around PyData DC later this year, where we're going to get all of the project leaders for all of the NumFocus projects together to help tear down some obstacles to collaboration within the projects. So think how often does, how often is there unnecessary overlap between what each of these tools do? I mean, there's a lot of overlap between what Pandas does with regards to, I mean, Pandas ends up wrapping a lot of NumPy, a lot of matplotlib. Think about rough spots in that kind of wrapping. Think about areas where all of these projects could make use of some consensus around data formats, tools like Arrow that uh, Wes, Wes McKinney has been talking about recently, and building that consensus, getting all the projects on the same page, and getting them to collectively decide a direction to go could unify development of these tools and really accelerate their development. Could also you know, really help us eliminate some of these un completely unnecessary areas of friction in terms of how the tools integrate with each other. I mean, think about all the ways, think about, think about how many times you've used a tool and you're like, you know, I wish Jupyter Notebook had a much more convenient way to pretty print this output or I wish Jupyter Notebook could represent this data a little bit better or could handle this type of exception a little bit better. There's a lot of work that can be done there and it's difficult where the tools themselves are somewhat siloed for them to collaborate in that fashion. They, all of the project maintainers know each other and they all communicate with each other frequently online, but getting them all together in one room for a couple of days really makes a big difference. And that's one thing that NumFocus is gonna do this year and you can begin to see the power of having all of these related tools under that same umbrella. So the last four tools here, Theano. Theano, I think, is typically thought of as a deep learning library. It's in the same way as Dined, a little bit broader than that. It's supposed to be a library for you know, uh, effective computation of multidimensional arrays, um, in addition to things like uh, being able to do um, derivation on doing numerical derivation on these. So you can think for deep learning, you build you know, very large structures of, or you, you represent the network as a very large multidimensional array and then you do things like figure out, you do your back propagation and forward propagation. Um, Stats models is a library for statistical computations. There's a lot of overlap between what stats models does and what certain parts of scikit-learn do. I would say stats models is supposed to be a 
statistical tool for statisticians. And so oftentimes when I'm doing things like corporate training and I talk about scikit-learn, I talk about stats models, I can show examples doing linear regression in using tools coming out of SciPy, using stats models, or using scikit-learn. And the reason that I often choose to do the example using stats models is that the output is very similar to what an R user would expect, what a statistician would look like. So there's a lot of focus on things like, you know, metrics like R squared and whatnot. Whereas scikit-learn is more about machine learning and, and producing predictions. Uh, finally, X-Array is a tool that I don't know too much about. X-Array is, you know, one of the big limitations of NumPy's and D-Array is that you, have the, you don't have the ability to look at label dimensions. So you can think how many people are using n-dimensional data, but they want to have labels on that dimension. They want to have some kind of pandas behavior, but they're not looking at tabular data. They're looking at array data, but they need some of the slicing and dicing and indexing ability that you get with tabular data with pandas. X-Array is trying to be a pandas, but for scientists who are not looking at tabular data, who are not looking at columnar data. Um, lastly, Spider is an interactive development environment for Python. I mean, we all, we all have used tools like PyCharm and we've used tools like maybe even Jupyter Lab. And Spider is just a development environment. So with that said, that's the actual core content that I wanted to, 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 to share with you. Just a very brief overview of all the projects. Just some terms you might hear, some names you might hear. Just a little bit of information to guide you in the right direction for this is something that might be more interesting for me to look into but also to give you a little bit of context about where, why these projects are under the NumFocus banner, what NumFocus is all about, that's that. So with that said, you know, we have a lot of time. I would love if Leah could talk about some of the future of NumFocus and where NumFocus is going, where the tools are going. And also, before we leave, I would like to talk about, you know, how do you fit into this? Because the purpose of this talk and the purpose of this event is not for you to come and just see me talk about this stuff. I can speak for you know, days about this, but it's not, it's not that valuable. The purpose here is to give you enough information to motivate you or engage you to do something with that. Either you know, in a BOF session that we might run tomorrow or the next day to see, are you interested in helping out with PyData? Are you interested in being, a, being on the speaker selection committee? Are you interested in being one of the organizers, somebody on the ground who's helping us run these events? part of a committee that makes sure that these events, you know, we've done a lot of additional initiatives events, like women in technology things, if that's something you're interested in. We want to motivate you to volunteer. From the NumFocus side, it's a little bit harder because, you know, this is mostly for people who are working on open source projects, but it's very likely that you, you may be working on a project like this, or you may know people who are working on a project like this, who have certain questions about, well, I've got contributors, I've got code, where does it go from here? So that's one thing that I'd like to talk about before we break, but I'd like to give some time for Leah to tell me all the things that I said wrong. Thank you. Um, so where's NumFocus going? What pro are there any new projects that are in the pipeline that you want to talk about? Other than Bokeh? Yeah, I think it's... Are they too early in the... Yeah, I think it's probably a good idea to... Tweets it? Most projects do want the um, the comprehensive model because they want to be able to take advantage of the um, the benefit of being able to totally release their financial administration over. So so they can do what they do best, and and we can do what 
you know, the help that we can bring to, to the projects. One thing, one thing I'd like to add is none of this stuff is behind closed doors. Non-focus is a non-profit. All of this information you can get on the non-focus website. Most of what we do is based on the public's interest in how this works. It's not because any of this information has been hidden. It's just where these projects are going, or how they're governed, or who's really in charge of these, or who's on the steering committees. All that is, if, you're even, if you even wonder, where does my 300 plus dollars of high data ticket price go to, that's on the website as well. And I can tell you where it goes. It goes to supporting projects. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's what we're, what NetFocus was created for. And as, as James said, um, the four, the five founding board members were Travis Oliphant and Fernando Perez and John Hunter and uh, Perry Greenfield, Jared Millman and um, Anthony Skopatz also came in um, at that time before he got on the board was um, our first treasurer. So can't um, can't leave Anthony out of out of that picture. Um, and their goal was to support scientific computing projects. And um, I think James did a great job of talking about that. One thing um, that I, he did, he did mention a couple things about what a fiscally sponsored project, um, what are some of the requirements for that. And I think um, one thing he didn't um, mention was a code of conduct. And so it's really important that um, any project that comes on board does have a code of conduct and we make sure that they have a policy for um, um, inclusion and diversity um, that's that's in place as well as a um, governance governance model and a leadership team that is set up that he said it, you know as James mentioned is not from one organ um, one for-profit or even one university we want to make sure it's um, widespread This is actually more beneficial for the organizer than it is for non-focus. Because oftentimes, especially if you're from one organization, you might feel pressure to do things one way or another. You might feel like, you know, paying me money and I'm also organizing. I'm also volunteering on the side. And by making sure that this is a community-driven event that isn't founded by any one group, it also helps you say, well, you know, my boss asked me to do something. So, um, so that so it's important to be able to serve both the contributors to the tools and also the community that uses them. So, both the contributor and the user base are, are very important to what NumFocus is doing. And we're really excited on something that kind of affects everyone. Um, we just received a grant from the Sloan Foundation for a large sustainability project. And this will be the first project. We've been really trying to put this out there. There's a blog on the NumFocus website about it. Um, we've also tried to, um, trying to get it out through various sources um, talking about this project. It'll be the first, kind of first of its kind that will be created to kind of make a toolkit for sustainability that first of all, it's gonna be working with the NumFocus fiscally sponsored projects and after that, we're hoping it's something that this kit can be carried on and used to um, other open source projects um, beyond them focus. What, what would that role do? And if anybody in this audience is interested in Well, we have the, the, lead, the person that's going to be, um, I guess, carrying this out from the NEM focus side will be a projects director that we have open right now. And that person will be working with the projects, working with, so the program is to be able to create project sustainability through a couple different ways. One is to um, kind of introduce projects to, you know, do you need a business plan? What is, you know, what financially, what do you need to um, think about financially for your, you know, the future of your project? And then also 
communication. How are you going to? How are you communicating to the public what your project does? Do you need some help with your website? Do you need, um, you know, maybe marketing? Might you know, think about a little bit about marketing communication to the public? And then the last step in that, the very important step, is to foster industry relationships. So, um, what you know. How are corporate relationships going to help your project? Can we, um, obviously funding is, is one thing that's important. These projects are used by a lot of companies and those companies are being able to do some incredible things um, and making lots of money from, from the tools also. And the projects are needing things. There's things that um, they need to make to see happen. And so how, how do we foster those relationships and bring that together? That's been a goal of NetFocus is from the beginning. It's very important right now in the open source world, creating this um, kind of bridge between corporate use and um, and the contributors, and you know what I guess contributor needs and corporate use, and trying to create a bridge between that. So that will be um, really important, and part of that, um, the way that that's going to come about is through workshops. We're going to bring projects together and actually give them training workshops um, on skills, bring professionals in. Um, so the project director will work, work on that, work with an advisory board of um, professionals across both industry and academia who will work with projects. So the, we're really excited about that. I think sustainability is a huge, um, you know, the projects, if they're, if they're not sustainable, if they're not gonna continue, then it's not gonna do anyone any good. And so um, we're really excited about that. And um, please if, put the word out there if you know someone who would be great for that projects director position. We're um, taking applications for that right now. So yeah, I think that's about it. Well, you're well. You're here. You're here, so you're involved. <laughs> it's very easy to do. So I'll tell you my, the history of my involvement. I I gave my very first Python talk in 2012 at a local Python conference. Python. Um, I wanted to give that same talk somewhere else, and I saw a conference called Pi Beta online. It's the local Python conference. It was in New York. Uh, I took the same talk that I gave. And then when I gave the talk at the PyData event, it just kind of gelled and everything came together. Maybe just having that one miserable experience made it work out. And I basically left right after my talk because I was going to speak at Pi Arkansas that same weekend. So I didn't really spend more than an hour or two at that PyData event, but I went to Pi Arkansas because I had to go to Pi Arkansas. Um, I enjoyed Pi Arkansas, but it's not an event that I have been to since the first one. Uh, then, the next year, 2013, I think there was a Pi Data event in San Francisco, and I thought, I've never been to San Francisco before, why don't I go to San Francisco? So I applied to speak at that event, and uh, they kept, I think there was something about my talk title or something that they, they kept getting wrong on the schedule, and I had to keep emailing Leah about. So I had a lot of conversation back and forth with Leah, like, can you fix this on the schedule online? But I didn't really, and, and I realized, here's the thing, Whenever you're dealing with a large organization, always be nice to the people in operational and administrative roles because they're the people who really make things happen. So I thought I got to be really nice to Leah Silent because I can tell she's a big shot. But otherwise, I had no clue who she was. Then I spoke again at Pi Data in Boston because I live in New York and it's not that far to go, and I've never been to Boston before either. And then come Pi Data in New York, uh, I thought, well, why don't I get a little bit involved? I live in New York. We have a meetup group in New York. You know, it's going to be a nice event. I'll, I'll help get some of my friends involved, get some free tickets for some people, um, you know, give a talk myself. And I think that was the very first Pi Data event that I volunteered with. And of course, when you volunteer at an event like this, there's always a million things to do. Uh, there's always, you know, one thing that's, oh, this speaker needs to be in this room instead, or we need to find this speaker, or the video adapter's not working. There's always something to do. Come the next year, we had scheduled Pi Data London uh, and we had six weeks to put that together. 
And in a panic, I said, okay, I'll help out. And I don't know how we made that event happen, but we made that event happen. And that was when I think I really first started volunteering with NumFocus because it was a PyDid event and it was a lot of fun because it was a game of who, who do I know who's near London who can be emailed on a short notice to come speak and you know people cancel for the event at the last minute who can fill in. The, the event space was actually fairly small. One speaker ha had, to, had come like from the ER to give their talk and then went right back. It was deadly sick and there was all sorts of issues there but it was a lot of fun. And so it kind of cascaded like that because I thought if I want to go on some vacations, but I don't, I'm a computer programmer, so I don't really like going outside, why don't I just go to places for PyData conferences? Because I can tell people I've been there. I can tell people I've been to London, but I don't really have to do that messy stuff like, I don't know, seeing sites and dealing with human beings. I can sit in an air-conditioned room all day and play on my computer. Um, so I, I started, started attending more PyData events and helping out and helping out more and more and more. But it wasn't like at some point somebody came to me and said, oh, you're so amazing, you know, you need to come help, you're such an amazing person. It's just, I helped out a little bit here, I helped out a little bit there, and then it just kind of snowballed. And I, and I think that while that, that is something that we continuously see for the volunteers that we have at our various events, the volunteers with NumFocus, oftentimes it's somebody who just, you know, they were, they were around and they wanted to do one thing, and then they got really excited and really engaged and they wanted to do more and more and more and more, and it snowballed. The key to that, though, is, you don't have to attend 20 PyData events to help out with the PyData event. You don't have to attend 20 PyData events to, to be on stage talking to people about NumFocus. You just have to be willing to do it, and you can start at any level, at any size, anything that you want to do. One thing that I would really, really like NumFocus to do is to put together people who can talk about NumFocus at different events in different places. Because Leah's based in Texas, I'm based in New York. Clearly, if there's an event in San Francisco, two weeks from now, neither of us will be able to attend. We would love if people would be interested in saying, okay, I, I'd like to learn a little bit about the mission of NumFocus and you know, get some talking points and go and help run a booth and give out stickers and tell people about it and tell people what we want to do. And that's really the core of how NumFocus is supposed to operate. You know, at a booth, we're not marketers. We're not supposed to be there with some fancy booth kit. We're supposed to be just representatives of a broad community. That's one thing that I would really really love to see some volunteers, especially people in San Francisco, who are willing to do. If you'd like to go to an event, we'll get you a free ticket to the event. Go and sit at a booth, tell people about NumFocus, tell people about PyData, tell people about the projects. Tell people about your own personal experience using the projects. You'll have people come up to the booth and they'll be like, I've been using MATLAB for the last 10 years. What's this Jupyter thing? What's this NumPy thing? And you'll say, oh my goodness, this is the most amazing thing ever. You've got to get on it. What's this you know, I'm an, I'm an R programmer, but R is not really a great language. You say, well, have you looked at Julia? What's Julia? And you show them some demo. It really changes, it really changes their perspective on things. We want to find people who can fill that role. And it's not, it's not a lot, to, it's not, it doesn't require a lot. It just requires the desire to, you know, attend an event and sit at a booth and tell people about the projects and help support a community. So that's my pitch for all of you. And I can tell you quite, quite literally those, or Leah can, Leah can correct me because Leah is the executive director and she's the one who actually has the authority for these things. But in my understanding, that is something that we really do need because there are a lot of events happening on the West Coast that we'd love for NumFocus to be a part of, but we physically can't be a part of it because they're, it's, it's hard for us to make it. And, and some people who are volunteers at this event actually served exactly that role at the Data Data Science Summit a couple weeks back. They helped run a booth because it was the same week as SciPy and we had to be at SciPy. They helped run a booth. We, we got them into that event. They got to see some nice talks. They got to tell people about their own experience. They got to tell people about NumFocus. And that's all it took. So now who's interested in helping out with something? <laughs> Even fewer people. That's great. That's great. Um, so I think that's all the content that I have, I have prepared for this. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Otherwise, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being able to present this information for you. And hopefully we'll be able to do more of these kind of sessions at future events. Thank you so much.